Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Hope. My name's Hope. She's not here today, but like Franklin, I'd like to thank them for doing great work. So, um, kia ora. When I first started getting emails uh, about this, coming to this amazing thing, they said kia ora. And I was um, a little bit confused because in my country, when I grew up, kia ora was the name of an orange juice. And I'm slightly horrified by this. So I felt it imperative to stand up and apologize for not only the many things that my country has done to so many parts of the world, but now I have to apologize for orange squash as well. Um, so this isn't really going to be about me, but I'm going to start by telling you about the journey I went on to make my first film. I'm going to start about six years into development of that. Um, I'm breastfeeding my second son. It's 3 a.m., and I'm anxious, and I'm concerned about the script and this problem I'm having, and I suddenly decide to leave the screen industry, the film industry, no more. Oh, my God, the sense of relief is amazing. I'm, my milk probably... Um, I bounce down to breakfast the next morning, and I, I announce this to my husband. I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm going to get another job. It's just going to be so much better. And he's like, that's great. That's really great. Might you miss it? Ah... Maybe you could do it in a different way. Yes, that's better. I think that is better. So that was the beginning of Raising Films. As was said, Raising Films is a community and campaigning organization for parents and carers. Carers are, I think some of you call them caregivers. They're people who you look after, maybe an elder or a sibling or a partner or a child with additional needs. Um, so we exist to provide solidarity, support, and push for change in the UK screen sector. Our approach is wholly intersectional. We believe that solutions to perpetuate any kind of exclusion are not solutions. And we are solution-driven, acknowledging, of course, that the space to rant and articulating the barriers is, um, is also important as a route to bringing about change. So just to take us back a couple of steps, um, I'd like you all to remember a mere maybe five or six years ago where every panel on the lack of female filmmakers centered around our lack of confidence. Do you remember that? That was good times. Um, attending one of these many talks uh, with a baby strapped to my chest, I realized that what we weren't talking about was the elephant in the room, parenthood. And we needed to talk about it because women are disproportionately affected professionally by parenthood. So what is true about parenthood um, where I come from is that people still think of it as a choice. And by choice, they mean selfish or a luxury of some kind. Here, uh, I have to say it's been wonderful to witness um, the Maori culture as being incredibly aware of the family responsibilities, celebrating them inclusive to family. Um, and I'm, I've, it's been incredibly moving for me. But where I come from, it's not true. Um, you, uh, and you're not allowed to complain about the consequences of having children because you chose to have them, right? So the thinking, this kind of thinking puts the onus of affecting change and of you know, making the change, making the difference on the individual when it's the system itself that is not supporting us. It's the system that's broken. The important thing to remember is that we need children. Children uh, make up our society. Humans is who we are. So to suggest that having children is a choice that engenders necessary exclusion from society is ridiculous. Um, but the truth also is that many people are forced to choose not to have children because our society and our industry makes it so hard to have them and to develop and sustain a career and a life. Of course, this is less true of men who um, have for years had children and great careers. But we don't exclude men from our mission at Raising Films because they're actually part of the solution. So we are um, open to all genders. So once you stop thinking of having children as a choice and start thinking of it as important work that's essential to our society, suddenly there's a more of an impetus to figure out how to stop excluding parents from the industry which tells the stories which shapes society. And I'm not going to talk about how being a parent makes for richer stories, but trust me, a lot of us who have children feel like we couldn't be the storytellers we are without them. So we got to work. We got to work. How is this working? 
There it is. Okay. Um, we ran the first survey into the effects of parental responsibilities on a career in the film industry. It's the first time anyone's done this. And we found that 79% of respondents felt that being a career negatively affected their career. Uh, sorry, being a parent. Did I say parent? Anyway. Um, if you're parents and you don't understand why this is, I'm just going to quickly tell you. It's a combination of not having any money to pay for childcare, uh, to do your job, um, or to pitch for your job, and then feeling torn between having a job that demands your presence 14 hours a day and a child who wants you for 24 hours a day, and then not being able to participate in all the unpaid extras that the industry demands of us in order to get anywhere in our careers. So. It's, uh, it's fun. So bear in mind, this survey did not record the numbers of people who have left the industry because of becoming a parent. We, we can't tell their stories at the moment. So 79%, um, it's, pretty, it's pretty damning. Uh, it's the headline stat. There are lots more. And if you'd like to read the report, uh, Making It Possible, it's available on our website, and, uh, which is raisingfilms.com. So we made four recommendations from this. The first was that the industry start to enable financial assistance for childcare. Um, we also suggested the industry uh, adopt flexible working across the whole industry and access to childcare. We also wanted to formalize a way to combat discrimination. This is something I'm going to come back to. And we also encouraged the industry to normalize conversation around caring commitments. So we started with a conversation. We wanted the conversation to continue. So we needed to do more. We knew that we had just started to, started to expose this story. And to tell it properly, we needed more stories, more input, more engagement. We needed qualitative as well as quantitative data. We wanted to present solutions. We also realized that to ensure our work was as intersectional as possible, we needed to frame it so that people could see that the barriers parents and carers were facing were some of the same ones experienced by other, ma other marginalized populations who weren't parents. So we wanted to make sure that our proposed solutions for our community could be adopted by those fighting for inclusion out with parents and carers. So we held a conference with many sectors of our industry and produced another publication authored by Dr. Tamsin Dent. This one's called Raising Our Game. It's fantastic, and I highly recommend reading it. In particular, there are four checklists at the end for different sectors of the industry recommending how uh, you can employ or be employed in a lawful way. It reminds you of your rights for employment. In short, this piece of research looked at the effects of the casualization of the labor force in our industry um, and how prevalent it is that people are hiring uh, unlawfully. There were three conclusions. Um, the first is that diversity schemes are not shifting the numbers. Uh, we're at the same, sorry, statistics around equality and diversity that we have been for years. Now, I know we heard some encouraging stuff yesterday, and I'm happy, to, happy that's happening, but it hasn't been. The, the kind of diversity work that's been done for so many years is just diversity work, and people aren't actually engaging in the work of hiring these populations. They're just checking boxes. The second thing was the way we employ people isn't lawful which is different from being illegal, so they can't be arrested, but it basically means employers aren't following the Equality Act in our country. I'm sure there's something similar wherever you're from. Or perhaps worse, the Equality Act itself is not fit for purpose for the work that we do, which is important because the work industry is leaning towards the kind of work we do. The gig economy is becoming the major way that people are employed around the world. So this is crucial. Finally, language matters. We need to be more mindful of how we talk about identity, and I think that's something we all know. So not long after this publication, onto the uh, lawful, the way that the industry is unlawfully hiring people, and um, because of that, there are harassment and, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Because where people are being discriminated against, the Weinstein allegations broke, and on the basis that we just published this piece of, um, uh, work, looking at the circumstances under which harassment and discrimination happened, we felt it was appropriate for us to respond to this crisis. We were the first UK group to do this, and our letter um, was signed by over 500 members of the UK screen industry, including the heads of several unions. We called for an investigation, a tribunal, a support network, and scalable HR training. Um, we were told to, uh, by many, many of the other people above us to watch out for mission creep 
stay stay on the babies, and uh, that's that's where we're really best suited. And we were not invited to the table when the BFI and BAFTA gathered to talk about how to respond to the allegations and the spreading wildfire crisis um, of Me Too. So their formal response six months later was one encouraging people to respect each other. And as a group whose number included uh, a rape survivor, we felt this was inadequate and are still pushing for more formal uh, responses to this within our industry. Finally, our final intervention we have done recently is a survey into carers who work in the screen industry. It addresses slightly different issues because carers obviously have different um, responsibilities, um, but we felt it was crucial because our, our MO is talking about things people don't want to talk about. So um, this felt important. Uh, shockingly, 82% of carers felt their careers had suffered from caring responsibilities. And I don't need to point out to you that most carers are women. Again, the report's on the website. But if you want to know how best to help caregivers who uh, you work with, the first thing you can do is recognize their responsibilities, create a space for them to talk about their work, uh, their, their responsibilities at work, be, give them awareness and flexibility. That's the main things they want. So as an organization, we do other things. We run training days. Ironically, these are led by a life coach, and yes, the issue of confidence does come up. We have a fund that awards money to those who need help with childcare and caring costs, and we've just started hosting some writing residencies. We've also recently started awarding a special Raising Films ribbon to those organizations or productions who are putting in the effort to be properly inclusive workplaces. We want to celebrate good practice. But we need to do more. I don't live in a country where my Prime Minister breastfeeds in Parliament. Thank God, actually, with the Prime Minister I have. <laughs> Sorry for that image. Um, I don't come from a country where childcare is recognised properly as a social responsibility. And society dictates how we're allowed to work. So while we're looking at what we face in terms of ending systemic exclusion in our industry must also face the reality that many of the barriers to many populations come from social norms and laws. And so our work extends to engaging with that, with government policy, with members of parliament who are tackling the nitty gritty level of parliamentary subgroups and bills and acts. Currently, the Equality Act, which we feel is unfit for purpose, as I said above, is being discussed and evaluated by the government. We've contributed to this consultation in the hope that what we've learnt will help redesign it. We're also embarking on a campaign to make childcare costs for freelancers tax deductible in a more robust and functional way than they currently are. As parents and carers, thank you. We understand that life is messy and complicated. We understand that having people to care for can be a choice, but sometimes it isn't. We understand that solutions are often compromises and change is incremental as much as we'd like it to be radical. We understand that effort can be just as important as results. As filmmakers, we understand that stories are powerful, that culture is created, and change can be affected through these stories. Like many others, we understand that a diverse array of voices means richer representations and stories, and we understand that inclusive working conditions helps to allow those artists to remain in work. So as parent and carer filmmakers, as, as raising films, we formed a space where it's okay to be on a journey, it's okay to be uncertain, it's okay to ask for change and for help. That in itself feels rare and precious in our industry and we want to make sure we protect that space and open up that space in other countries' industries. For those who join us, for those who need us and for the industry itself, which clearly needs help in growing up. We're very proud to have a chapter in Australia now, and next week I'll be in Wellington meeting with anyone who's interested in setting up a New Zealand branch. If you can't make it there, please get in touch with me and I can make sure you're part of the conversations. Thank you so much for listening and recognizing that the solutions are so much more complicated than the aspirations. Power to everyone who is doing the mahi.